In the name of Jesus. The spirit of the living God will move mightily in your life. And at the end of this study, you will be a better warrior. You will be a champion for Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. A loud amen. amen. Let's have a seat. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Last week we began to look at hearing from God. If you have your hand out, can you wave it at me, please? Good. And I shared with you that day that immediately you begin to hear from God, your progress as a Christian begins. And that if you are deaf to God, you stand at a very great disadvantage. And that when you begin to move in the things of God, the best thing you must pursue is to be able to hear clearly from God. Those who hear clearly from God don't make mistakes. They don't do trial and error because they have heard clearly from God. And that time we looked at the three different kinds of uh, communication, revelation, inspiration, illumination. Then we look at why God speaks. That was last week. We look at the advantages of hearing from God. That was last week. Then we look at how do we know the voice of God? And then when God speaks, what happens? We look at all these last week. And the same last week, we now began to study how God talks to people. And I remember describing to you that there are various methods of communications. Just like human beings have various methods of communication, there are various methods that God communicates to. I, as a human being, I can talk to you, say, do this. That is, I'm communicating. I've spoken to you to do something. That's one method of communication. You may be standing before, I may do like this. That means what? Sit down. I've communicated to you, but I've not spoken. I use my hand to sit, to sit down. They may ask you a question at an interview, and then uh, you're about to say the wrong thing, and somebody did like this. That means don't talk. That Your answer is wrong. So keep quiet. So just like human beings have different methods of communication, God himself too has different methods of communication. And the most important thing for you is in all the methods that God used to communicate, you must at least have one, one, one by which he speaks to you. If he, however, now decides not to speak to you, then you have a problem. If God is not talking to you, you have a problem. If you are the kind of person who will bring seven names, you take seven names of guys to your mother to go and pray. Say, Mama, all these seven men are troubling my life. Pray. Which one? Then something is wrong with you somewhere. You ought to be able to pray and know who and who. That's the purpose, one of the purposes of fearing from God. There is nobody in life who will not come to a situation sometimes when you need to take a decision and you need guidance from heaven. You take the wrong decision, that may be the end of your destiny. This is why it's important you understand this study very well. You pray it into your life. You begin to practice it. You begin to use it until you get familiar with it. A lot of people don't understand how to hear from God yet. Just like Samuel in the Bible, who did not know that God was talking to him. God talks to so many people, but they don't know. They don't know how to recognize it. The purpose of this study is to teach you how you can start picking out words that God is speaking. For example now, if I ask you here now, how many people has the Holy Spirit spoken to this week? Some will say he spoke to me, some will say he did not speak. And some will say, I don't know whether he has spoken or he has not spoken. You see, but you see that gentle voice that tells you you have not read your Bible this morning. That's his voice. That gentle voice that tells you you need to pray a little bit more. That's his voice. That voice that tells you when somebody is annoying you, saying something you don't like, the voice that says, 
don't worry yourself, just go away. That's the voice of the Holy Spirit. So he speaks. The trouble is getting his voice. And that's why we're here. And so we've been looking at these different methods God speaks last week. And we look at face to face in a two way communication. I dealt with that last week, explained to you that even in this modern world, as modern as the world is, as sophisticated as it is, God can still sit down like this the way you have seen me now talking to you like this, face to face. Moses spoke to God face to face. In fact, Moses went a step further. They even they they had dinner with God. Yes. So that can still happen even these days. And as young people, I see no reason why God cannot talk to you one on one. I see no reason. I can understand an old man who has lived a lot of uh, terrible life, he's done a lot of strange things, he's committed strange iniquities. But when you, as a young person, God is avoiding you, then something is wrong somewhere. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. But in the situation, where the young men are now the dreamers and the old men are seeing the visions, then we have serious problem to solve. And this is why we're here. I believe this is a meeting of champions. Those who want to grow. Those who want to move forward in God. So some of the words we're going to say here may not be particularly easy. But then you don't find good, you don't, you don't train good pilots on clean weather. The best pilots are trained when the weather is rough. So, the best captains of ship and planes are known in rough weather, not in clean weather. Those, those are not uh, they are not proper captains. The best soldiers are known at the war front. The best soldiers are not just those who carry their gun on October 1, Nigerian Independence Day and they are marching up and down at TBS without fighting any enemy and you become a general by not fighting anybody. So just not, those are not soldiers. So try and understand what we're saying. So the first method there is face to face in a two way communication. And that day we read our Exodus 33 11. The second method there is by a voice. God can speak and you can hear his voice the way you are hearing me now. And I try to explain to you that the why some of us don't hear. His voice is because we rush into the place of prayer. We rush out of the prayer room. We talk to God, but we don't wait for him to talk back before we run away. And you cannot force the truth of God to talk. So you, it is you who have to be patient and let God speak to you. And I tell you something. <laughs> if God speaks to you for five minutes, it's better than the congregation of all general overseers in the world talking to you for two days. Five minutes. Five minutes with the Almighty is better than all you. Gather our general overseers, no matter how good they are. Let them talk to you for two days. They won't get the result. The five minutes you spend with God will get to you. I pray that there will be somebody here who will key into what I'm saying now. Yeah. And your life will no longer remain the same. Yeah. Then that day we cover dreams too. Dreams. And I said, you can meet God in your dreams. We have studied this some time ago at the youth church, very, very many, many months back. God can talk to you through your dreams. God can use your dream to direct you. God can show you deep revelations in your dream. You can have what to call a night vision. That is, you, 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 a vision that you have at night. You can have that. God speaks through that word. And the earlier you begin to sanitize your dream life, the better. If at this level now, you are still struggling with uh, spirit husband, I still struggle, somebody is giving me rice to eat. I still struggle that I saw a crocodile pursuing me in my dream. I still struggle with I'm, I'm bathing in the river. I still struggle that somebody is trying to choke me in my dream. Then you need to go above that level and leave that level alone and get away from those demonic dreams to divine dreams. And I pray that anyone here who is still having these demonic, demoting dreams shall be delivered in the name of Jesus. Now we go to number four. 
Number four is open vision. Open vision. In Acts chapter 10, verse 1. How many of us have time to look at this paper when we go to? If you look at it, can you wave at me when you go to? Good. So, study it more when you get to. Look at all these scripture references. And that's how God will use it to bless you. Acts chapter 10. I read from verse 1. In Bible study, you bring your Bible, you open your Bible, you take notes, you look at your outline. You do three things together. Your Bible, your, 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 your notes you are taking yourself, and your outline. This is Acts of Apostles chapter 10, verse 1. Are we there? There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. You can see the qualification of that man. A devout man, he feared God, he was a very kind person, and he prayed to God always. Then what happened in verse 3? He saw in a vision. Evidently, about the night hour of the day, an angel of God coming to him and said unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid. And said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine harms are gone up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose son name is Peter. This was the journey that led Cornelius to receive the baptism in the Holy Ghost. That's the journey that led Cornelius, who was not a Jew, to receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He was not sleeping. He was looking, eyes open the way you're looking at me now. And an angel just walked in, into that room. That is what you call open vision. You're not sleeping. Your eyes are open like this. And you see somebody who is not a human being walking to you. You clearly see that heavenly person with your physical eyes. You're not sleeping. You're not closing your eyes. I've seen that messenger from heaven coming to you. It is still possible today that you will be praying. You may even be sitting down and an angel of God walks up to you and he begins to communicate with you. It is still possible today. And I don't see anything stopping you from having God talk to you that way. You can see that it was this angel and I now told Cornelius what to do. Say, Cornelius, move. Go and get somebody called Peter. When that Peter comes, he will tell you more. And by the time Peter came and preached a small message, the Holy Ghost fell on everybody in the household of Cornelius and they began to speak in tongues. But it was that vision that gave him the breakthrough. The vision, open vision like this. I'm not sleeping. You say, well, I would like that to happen to me. I too want to be able to sit down and see an angel. And the trouble is that many of us see angels, but we don't recognize them. That's the thing. You, you see them, but you do not recognize them because you have built up an impression in your head that if it's an angel, there must be wing. Must have wings, feather, and it must be a white man. <laughs> Mistake. Angels have the power to take the form of anyone, anywhere they are. They may even sit beside you in church and you don't know. You don't know. And there are many people who have been kidnapped by ritual killers who were delivered by the angels of the living God, but they weren't white people. They came in their own figure and, and delivered them. I pray that the Lord will open your eyes. Yeah. That's what you call open vision. The good thing about this thing we are teaching you is that you can pray it into your life. That's a good thing. Even if you have not been experiencing it, you can pray it into your life and begin to experience it. Cornelius was a prayerful man. Cornelius was a devout man. Cornelius was a very kind man. Cornelius was a, was a man who took his Christianity very seriously. So, for you to be seen open vision you have to you also have to be serious with your Christianity. 
You have to be prayerful. You have to be a kind person. You do your fasting and prayer regularly so that God too will enable your eyes to be open to see these heavenly creatures who come in and out, come in and out, come in and out in our services. For example, before we came in here now, some agents from heaven are already here. They don't need our doors to enter. They can enter through the wall, enter through the wall and go around and, and keep looking and keep a watch over the people of God. And you know, everyone has an angel. If you're a child of God, you have an angel guiding you. It, it's, it's a glorious day. The day God opens your eyes and you can see your own guardian angel. And you can know the places not to go and the places to go. Let this be very clear to you. Immediately you carry your bag and you are going to the house of a sinner friend. The angel will stay out and allow you to be messed up thoroughly there because you were the one that decided to go. There are some places the angels of God will not follow you to. And once they don't follow you there, anything can happen to you in that place. So there is open vision. Then, number five, there is closed vision. Closed vision. That is, you are closing your eyes. You are praying. And you are seeing things. Sometimes, as you close your eyes, as you are praying, the thing appears like a television set before you. Sometimes, you see just objects standing, not moving. And sometimes you start seeing them moving. Sometimes when you are praying, you begin to see things like that. Sometimes you are not even praying. Maybe you just finished praying. And you begin to, you, you are not sleeping. But you are seeing things moving about. That's what you call closed vision. That's the example of what you find in Acts of Apostles chapter 16. Verse 9. Acts 16 verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over unto Macedonia and help us. So that's what we call a closed vision. And any, anything that is spiritual in nature, you can always grow. Maybe when you first, when you first start praying, when you start praying, you may start seeing things like trees, leaves, bucket. Stationary things, not moving. After some time, as you continue praying, as you continue praying, without, now you begin to see moving things, moving things. And the greatest prayer warriors are those who, as they are praying, they are seeing things. That's the greatest prayer warrior. I see no reason why you cannot move in this kind of things. We call it closed vision. Do you know the difference between the open and the closed now? Then there's a third one there. Trance. A trance. In Acts chapter 10, verse 9. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew near unto the city, Peter went up unto the hour I stop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into what? A trance. He fell into a trance. And saw heaven open. And certain vessel descending unto him. And it had been a great sheet niche at the four corners and led down to the earth. So Peter saw a trance. That is, your physical senses are suspended. You are unconscious of your body. It's as if somebody, something takes you out of your body to go and be seeing things. That's what we call a trance. Someone looking at you from the outside may think you've gone into a coma or something. But that's what we call a trance. God takes you out to see things. We call that a trance. That's another way that God speaks to people. Number seven. By angels. God can send his angels to you to deliver messages to you. Number eight, by writings. God can write things. Or you can see an inscription. Maybe you want to miss your way. You are going to somewhere. 
you see an inscription written on the wall, written on a banner, written on a logo, and God uses that to talk to you. Number nine, by miracles. The Bible says, except people see signs and wonders, they will not believe. So those miracles that God does for people is a way that God is communicating to them that, look, I need you. Look, I want you to be serious. Look, I love you. So those miracles too, they are means of communication. Ten, through the written word, that is the Bible. You can do your quiet time, you open your Bible, and the place you read that day, God will use it to minister to you through that written word. I know some people, when they begin to fast and fast and fast and fast and fast and fast and fast, as they take their Bible, God will lead them to where to read, and that place they read will speak to them. You can, God can speak to you through the written word. Eleven, reference to passages. You might have prayed, you might have done all kinds of spiritual exercises, you fast, all of a sudden you begin to hear the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 13, book of Luke, chapter 7, you will hear actual Bible passages in your spirit. And by the time you open it, you find that it's an answer to the prayers you are praying. So we call it jumpy Bible verses. All of a sudden the word of God jumps to you and you begin to learn from it. Twelve, God can speak to you through anointed messages and teachings. A lot of people come to church with burdens in their heart. They are worried. They are depressed. But by the time the man used to preach, the message starts. They will find out what is worrying them. What is bothering their heart is what that person began to preach about. So that's how the anointed messages can be the word of God to you and can speak to you. 13 is anointed counseling. That is, somebody goes to the man of God for counseling. The thing was, the thing was beyond you. You didn't know what to do. You go to a man of God and he begins to counsel you, begin to tell you, this is what God wants you to do. God can speak to you through his vessel like that. 14. Working with holy men and women. When you move with men, and women of God, they sort of rub off on you, they rub off on you, they rub off on you, and very soon too, you begin to gain from what they are doing. That passage says that if you work with the wise, you'll be wise. If you work, if, but if, you're, if your companion is a fool, you'll be destroyed. So those who work with the wise will be wise. You know, there's somebody in the Bible called Joshua. Joshua was going about with Moses. When the journey started, God used to say, I want only Moses to come here. All of you stay down there. And all the rest of the Israelites will stay down there. Moses alone will enter. After some time, anywhere Moses went, Joshua smuggled himself into it. And God was not sending him out. God did not send Joshua out. God, Joshua just was smuggling himself. And after some time, when Moses was going, he had to hand over to that uh, Joshua. If you walk with men of God, you'll be godly. You walk with a sinner, you become a sinner. Show me your friends and I will tell you the kind of person you are. Fifteen, anointed music. There are music that is anointed with the spirit of God and when you listen to them your spirit will rise and you'll be able to communicate with heaven. Unfortunately now most of the music we have is for entertainment. It does not inspire anybody does not lead anybody to heaven. In fact, what it does is to activate the Babylonian demons that did not completely disappear in some people's body when they got born again. So they, to activate it, they will start, it will start them again. It doesn't move them towards heaven. It moves them towards the flesh. But when you listen to anointed music, God can speak to you through anointed music. The passage here is Elisha who said, bring me a musician. And they brought a musician. And as the person played, Elisha began to prophesy. 16 is anointed meditation. You take the word of God, you begin to read it, and begin to meditate. As you read, as you meditate, as you read, as you meditate, then God begins to speak to your heart. Praise the Lord. Are you following what I'm telling you so far? Then number 
17 is your conscience. This is where I want to spend some time now. So listen to me very, very carefully. It is not everybody who will begin to hear the voice of God immediately. It's not possible. It's not everybody who will begin to see visions immediately too. That one too is not possible. It's not everybody who will begin to see an angel coming to talk to you, moving to you, moving with you, sitting with you. That too is not possible. God in his own mercy has created a very clear method whereby he can talk to all of us. Everybody. Whether, whether you are asleep or you are awake. And that method is through our conscience. Say conscience. Say it again. Say it again. The question is, when we say conscience, what do we mean? What, do, what, what are we talking about? When we talk about conscience, I will try and explain to you very slowly and sluggishly. <laughs> So that you can understand. Because this is one method God can use, be, used, be using to talk to everybody. Whatever you want to place before the Lord, if you understand this method of God talking, you will get your answer. So I'm going to, be, I'm going to sluggishly explain it now. Make sure that you understand me as I go along. The first thing you need to understand is this. Man is three in one. Man is three in one. Man is a spirit living in a body and having a soul. Man is three in one. What did I say just now? What's the three part of man? So man is body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. That's what we are. A man is a spirit living in a body and having a soul. So, as you are sitting down there, listen to me. The real you is the spirit, not this one looking at me. <laughs> the real you is that spirit inside. When that spirit inside gets out of your body, that's when they say the person is dead. So, the real you really is a spirit. If God opens your eyes, and you see your spirit man, it, it will look exactly like you, but it's not physical body like this that you can hold. So the real you is the spirit man. Man is a spirit. He has a body. He lives in a soul. Can you see that and let me hear you? Now, the body is in three departments. The flesh, the bones, and the blood. The human body is in three departments. Flesh, bones, and blood. The soul is also in three departments. Your mind your will, your emotion. Soul is also in three departments. Your mind, your will, and your emotion. The spirit too is in three departments. There is knowledge, communication, conscience. The spirit has three departments. Knowledge, communication, conscience. Are you following me or do you want me to go through that again? The body has three departments. The flesh, the bones, and the blood. The soul has three departments. The mind, the will, and the emotion. The spirit has three departments. Knowledge, communication, Conscience. What's the three department of the spirit realm? Mm -hmm. That's how God made man. That's what the Bible says. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Now, everyone has a conscience. Everyone has a conscience. What is conscience? Conscience is the power of your mind to distinguish between right and wrong. The power of your mind to distinguish between right and wrong. You got that? What's conscience? Your conscience is your internal policeman. The internal policeman. That's the conscience. What is conscience? The con- your conscience is the judge inside of you. The judge inside of you. That's the conscience. That, that the judge inside of you who will be passing judgment on what you are doing. Whether what you are doing is right or wrong. It will, plus plan, it will, it will pass judgment. When you are thinking something bad, conscience says, that thought is bad. When you have just done something bad, that thought that comes to you and says, this thing that you have done is no good. Oh. That's the voice of the conscience. When you have taken a wrong action, the voice inside that says, this is bad. I mean, this is bad. You shouldn't have done this. It's bad. That's the voice of the conscience. So that conscience is our inner voice that lodges complain against us whenever we are guilty. We are guilty to keep punishing you, to keep talking, say this is wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. You should have done that, should have done that. I remember the story of that boy. He was 14 years old at that time. They took his father to court. That his father had killed his mother. Nobody saw this woman die. Nobody knew who killed the mother. But the police caught the father and said, you are the one that killed your wife. Police had no witness to rely on. The only witness police had was this 14-year-old boy. And the 14-year-old boy stood in that court and told the judge that he saw his father killing his mother. And so they executed his father. Eight years after, at the age of 22, conscience did not allow the boy to rest. He had to go and tell police that he was the one that killed the boy. Conscience didn't allow him to rest. That's what conscience does. It's our internal policeman. He'll be saying, no, no, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. When you do something wrong with your body, you can commit sin fall into fornication, do what you should not do, there is an inner policeman who will be saying, this is bad. You may be asking you to shut up, but you should still be talking. That this is bad. This thing you have done is strong. So, our conscience is God's police dog inside of us. Barking. Anytime we do something that is bad, it will be barking inside us. No, no, this is bad. You should have done that. So our, our conscience is, is God, God's protester. It's protesting badly when you do something wrong. That's what conscience is. Our conscience is like our internal alarm clock. An internal alarm clock. It will be ringing brrr, when you do something really, really bad. Do you understand what conscience is now? So is there anybody here without a conscience? Nobody. Everybody. Has a conscience. So one of the questions people used to ask us at Bible study say, Excuse me, sir, how about those people who didn't hear about Jesus? Those people who didn't hear about Jesus all over the world, they didn't hear about Jesus. When the day of judgment comes and rapture takes place, well, how can we judge them on the basis of Jesus, which they've never had? God will judge them according to their conscience. Because anytime you do something bad, there is a conscience that will say it's bad. Anytime you do something terrible, something inside you will tell you this is bad. This is bad. This is bad. 
some armed robbers went into a house to rob the house. They took things from them, took all kinds of things from them, took their money. After taking their money, instead of the armed robbers to go, they faced one lady there. They say, you look very beautiful. You have big breasts. Uh, undress. Ah. I say, sir, please. You have taken everything. Take your thing and go. I say, undress. Yeah. Brother, only jaw. I say, brother, only jaw. Brother, only, please. Jaw. Brother, only. So, when the arm robber had the girl, please, brother, only jaw. He started laughing. <laughs> So he laughed. He said, funny girl. And he took his gun and went. That arm robber still had the conscience. Conscience. So everybody that God has created, there is a part in your spirit called conscience. That conscience Listen very carefully. That conscience that you have is the voice of God talking to your spirit. The voice of that conscience that you have is the voice of God talking to your spirit. Let's open our Bible to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 20 verse 27. You should memorize this verse. Everybody must memorize Proverbs 20, 27. If you say it over and over again, in fact, you can memorize it before you leave this place. Say it over and over again, over and over again. It enters into your spirit. And as you begin to think about it, it does things to you. Have we found it? Let's read it. Let's go. The spirit of man is a candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Can you read it again? Say it again. That spirit, that part of you, which is your spirit, the Bible says it is the candle of the Lord. Candle. is is the one searching all the inward parts of the belly. That spirit of man that is inside of you. is the candle of the Lord. And the Bible says again in 1 Corinthians 2.11, 1 Corinthians 2.11 Are we there? For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Say, For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? So that your spirit knows everything about you. He's your prophet. He knows, he knows why you are on this earth. He has information about your life. He searches your innermost part. So, the earlier you begin to understand the voice of that conscience, which will not make noise in your ears, it will not shout you down, you will just be talking inside, inside, inside. That voice, once you get born again, and you are a child of God, and you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the voice of your conscience becomes the voice of God. Do that make sense to you? Or should I say that again? Mm-hmm. Because everybody has conscience, and the conscience corrects you, speaks to you. That voice of that conscience tell you this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Don't do this. That bad. That's bad. Even if a chronic unbeliever, if you take a knife and cut somebody's head, something inside you will say, "You have just killed a person. This is wrong." No matter how devilish you are, that thing will say, "This is wrong." There is nobody who will go to abortion clinic and after the abortion, something will not say, "You have just killed somebody." This is wrong. He will tell you, "You made this decision. Shut up." What is stop? <laughs> It will point your attention to it. That silent voice inside is actually the voice of God. When you now get born again and you have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, 
then that silent voice becomes the voice of God that will be speaking to you. So when you pray and pray and pray, that voice of your conscience that you used to recognize, God takes over that voice and begins to speak in your inside. That is one way God speaks to everybody. It's not everybody will be seeing vision at once. See all kinds of things at once. At once. So the human spirit has a voice. The voice of that human spirit is what people call conscience. The conscience of a man who is not born again is a terrible conscience. But the conscience of a man who is born again and who has received the baptism of the Holy Spirit has been washed in the blood of the Lamb becomes the voice of God that will be talking to you, that will be correcting you. It becomes the voice of God. A man went to attack another man somewhere. And the fight was in the night. And they fought and fought and fought. And he was able to kill this other man. But while the man was struggling with him, the man tore off two or three of his buttons, the button of his coat. But because it was in the night, he quickly took this fellow and buried him and buried him close by. Nobody knew that they fought. Nobody knew that somebody, that, that he was the one that killed the man. They started looking for the man, looking for the man. Eventually, they were able to find him in this grave that somebody had put him. But every night, when the man who killed him is in his sitting room, something will say, the button the button of your coat that fell down in that place. One day, police will find your button. The button. The button. For one year, he was struggling with it. He was struggling with it. But one day, now decided to go. And he got to the place and was still looking around. While the policeman appeared and said, I know what you are looking for. <laughs> I'm looking for the button. Looking for the button. I found it. I know that you'll come back and look for it. That's why they arrested him. So the conscience is an effective policeman. Very, very effective policeman. And it's the voice of God. It's, it's God's fingerprint on your sin. God's thermometer. That's that conscience. If you do not get anything out of this study, try and begin to train that conscience. To hear the voice of God. The Bible says, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. When you pray and you want to hear from God and you're still hearing by the level of your conscience, then you need quiet. You need silence to listen to your inner man and hear God talk to you. And as he talks to you and you begin to carry it out, carry it out, you begin to test what you are hearing, then you begin to you start understanding the voice of God talking to your spirit man. Hearing from God does not come automatically. Because the Adamic nature, the nature of Adam, is born deaf, deaf, dumb to God. So we need to learn it. We need to learn it. And the success of our life depends on how deeply and how seriously we are able to hear from God. So this issue it's so serious. And some other things that we are going to look at now is, is tied to the conscience. Praise the Lord. Now, number 18. The burden of the heart. God speaks to you through the burden of the heart. All of a sudden, you just find that your heart is heavy. Your heart is very, very heavy. You don't know why, but... You are, you are not feeling free. Your heart is heavy. Then, that heaviness of the heart, the burden of the heart, is God trying to tell you either to be careful or not to go, not to do it, or not to move into that realm. I've seen cases where somebody was standing by the bus up and the vehicle just came to him, ran him and broke it, ran down his leg and broke his leg. And by the time they dragged him from the gutter, he said, huh? And something was heavy in my heart that I should not go out this morning. But he did not listen. And that was it. The leg got broken. Burden in the heart. And any time 
you are in a relationship with somebody and your heart is not free, no peace. <laughs> your heart is heavy. You better stop and go and do something else first. Or go and they pray. Break it up. Go and they pray before you go and make mistake. That burden of the heart may be an alarm clock or siren warning you to be very, very careful. That is the burden of the heart. 19 is divine ideas. All of a sudden, you are not thinking about it. You did not meditate about it. An idea just comes. That, why don't you do this? Why don't you try that? Why don't you try that? We call it divine ideas. And by the time you put that divine idea into use, things begin to happen. Then, there is what to call intuition. That is the knowing signals. You just know. You don't know how you know. But something inside of you just says, something is wrong here. Something is right here. We call it intuition. Knowing signals. You perceive that something is wrong here. You can't put your finger on it, but something within you is uncomfortable. It's telling you something is wrong. That's what we call intuition. If, number 21, impression on the heart. The thing is just bombarding your heart. Go and do this. Go and do this. Go and do that. Don't give up. Go and do this. The thing is just pressing your heart. You try to escape from that thought. That thought refuses to go. That is what we call impression on the heart. I think it's convenient that we stop here. Because we still have a lot of things to cover. <laughs> I have a lot of things to cover. Praise the Lord. We'll, we'll, we'll continue with the inner voices and the rest of it because of our time. Now, anybody at all who will want to be a friend of God is like befriending human beings too. If you have a friend, you want to talk to that friend as frequently as possible. If you have a friend, you're always happy when you're in the company of that friend. <laughs> if you have a friend, sometimes the friend will escort you to your house. You talk, 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 talk. You escort him back to his house. You talk, 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 talk. <laughs> if you have a good friend, anytime you hear his voice, you're happy. That is how our relationship with God should be. It reminds me of that small boy. The small boy in his Sunday school who gave his own interpretation of Enoch. They read in the Bible, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Enoch was the first person who went to God. He didn't die. God just took him away. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So this small boy in Sunday school was interpreting it in the Sunday school. And look at the simple interpretation. He said, uh, teacher, the way I understand this thing, Enoch and God were friends. So they would talk, 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 talk into the night. So God would escort Enoch to his house and they would talk, talk, talk. Enoch would escort back to his house. They would talk, talk, talk. So one day, Enoch now escorted God to his house and never came back. <laughs> That's how he interpreted it. When you are a friend of God, you talk, you talk to God, you talk to God, you talk to God, and He talks to you. You talk to God, He talks to you. You talk, you, 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 you are happy praying. You are happy being in His presence. You are happy communicating with God. You are happy reading your Bible. You are happy talking to God. In fact, you take it as disturbance. So somebody is dragging you away from prayers. <laughs> then, you are, you, are, you are climbing. If you continue along that line, and you don't allow anybody to distract your attention, you soon become a spiritual giant. And if occasionally you wake up at night too, you stand up and begin to pray, there is nothing on this thing that is as powerful as night prayers. Now, if you wake up in night, instead of that time that you just, uh, 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 what's the time? <laughs> and you continue. Just wake up 
pray for 30 minutes or so, 20 minutes, and go to bed. Immediately after that prayer, your dream will change. And occasionally, God wakes people up at night. They don't know why they've woken up. Some they don't they are not feeling pressed. They don't want to don't they don't feel like going to the toilet. They don't feel like going to the loo. They, something just wakes them up. That time God is telling you, son, daughter, pray. Pray. There may be danger waiting for you somewhere. He's asking you to pray at that time. If at the time they ask you to pray, say, Ah and you got to sleep again. That's it. That's it. Then, we're talking about hearing from God. Those of you who are experts at eating very, very heavy meal at night. <laughs> hearing from God at night will be difficult to Very difficult. Because your tummy is so full and all your digestive system, your spirit man, all of them, they are concentrating on how they can digest the food in your tummy. So, when your tummy is that full and you, you knock yourself on the bed and sleep and God comes in the night and says, somewhere, somewhere, You won't hear anything. You've gone since. We lived for many years uh, in Akure before we came to Lagos. And you know, we're surrounded by the Kitty people. One serious demon in that area. Immediately, it is six o'clock. Boom, 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 boom. Everybody is pounding yam. Everybody. Six o'clock. Bam, boom, 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 boom. A pounding yam. And so people will swallow this large pounded yam every night and sleep. And when the voice comes, somewhere. Somewhere. So. Rise up on your feet now. Amen. Now look at me. And listen to me very carefully. Christianity is not a game. Christianity is not a fake thing. Christianity is reality. Read your Bible well. You will hear and God spoke to Elijah. And God spoke to Samuel. And God spoke to Isaiah. Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord. That's how the Bible is written. But it's our current generation that we don't hear anything. Simply because we're not serious. But Jesus is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. When Mountain of Fire and Merry Christmas just started, I used to run a program called Prophetic Prophetic Retreat. In those days, many, many years ago, we're talking about 1989. Prophetic Retreat. MFM will be 20 years old this year. Amen. <laughs> prophetic Retreat. That meeting, if you want to come, you are going to be admitted when you are on three days drive fast. That's the admission letter. Three days drive fast. 
So that is, you start your fast on Wednesday, Thursday, on Friday, we will admit you into the school. So, uh, one thing I noticed was that it didn't used to be a very large meeting at all. <laughs> Not many people come. Not many people come. So, when they come there, so I spend the whole of Saturday teaching them some of the things I'm teaching you now. Teaching them about the gift of the Spirit, how you can prophesy, how you can see visions, how you can receive revelations. I spend the whole day teaching in those days. All the schools that MFM is running now, there was a time I was the, I was the one that taught everything single-handedly. Now we have plenty of lecturers, we thank God. But that time, it was me that taught all the courses. <laughs> now. <laughs> so, we teach for the whole day. After all day, we start prayers. And then, by the time, when you have knowledge, you see, you understand the scriptures, you have knowledge, you have faith, and you live a holy life, my prayers get answered very quickly. Prayer gets answered very quickly. Those days, we do used to have people who will come to our prayer meeting and your boyfriend's letter is in your bag. The bag may catch fire. <laughs> in those days, I'm telling you the truth. In those days, when we start our prayer meeting, if you are not born again, or you have demons, and you are passing at the back of that primitive, the ground will be shocking your leg like electricity. Yeah. Those days. Right. We do used to have people who will come to the church dressing like angel. But when you see them on the street, you say, this is President Jezebel. We used to have people like that. So, we were at one of these meetings. We prayed one hour of serious prayers. One sister came. Sophisticated Cambridge sister, but she did the fasting. She was sitting at the back. As, the, as we say, in Jesus' name we pray. She looked back. She wasn't closing her eyes. When she looked back, she saw a giant man standing behind us. The legs were as tall as his ceiling and the head was up there. She quickly <laughs> quickly Turn back to us. Then she closed her eyes. She still saw him, even with the eyes closed. Ah! She was she was now afraid to look back. That was how God opened her eyes. I pray that your eyes will be open. <laughs> hey. When your eyes are open, oh, la, la. <laughs> then you will understand Jesus' messages more than what he's saying. Ah, when, you, when your eyes are open, <laughs> when your eyes are open, ah, 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 you will understand messages. When your eyes are open and somebody comes to propose marriage to you and God opens your eyes, where and you see a snake inside his tummy. <laughs> As he's saying, I love you, you see the snake dancing inside his tummy. Will you wait? So, amen. For the first time in her life, this lady who has a master's in Cambridge in English, God opened her eyes. She didn't used to believe them when they say they see into the spiritual realm. God opened her eyes. Immediately she left our meeting. She went to the house of is her best friend to break her fast. Her best friend. When she got there, she saw her best friend eating rice. In the physical, it was rice they were eating. But because her eyes are now open, what they were actually eating was human flesh. With blood. So, they now invited her to come and eat. And I said, no. And the friend was very upset. Say, ah, what do you mean? You, you normally eat in my house. Why don't you want to eat this one? Say, I'm not eating. Say, ah, eat now. The friend was getting angry. Ah, are you saying we poison the food? No. I'm not eating. When she left the place, she, she went home crying because she had been eating in that friend's house since 
they were in the secondary school not knowing the kind of friend she had. And that was what slowed down her destiny, stole her marriage, stole things from her. It is good for the Lord God to open your eyes. Close your eyes now. Can you press? I want you to pray. The prayers are for those who love their destiny. <laughs> and, and who want to shock their friends and surprise their enemies. It is good for you, you that are here, to become the prophet in your family. So if something wants to go wrong, God has shown it to you. Become a prophet. Can you say this loud and clear? My father! I'm here. I'm here. Open my eyes in the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and pray. Piata satanda ka, riboko sapanda ka ya bo shente rabakayaba. Open my eyes. Something is happening here tonight. Just receive the opening of the eyes. Receive it. 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 Masatakaya boshende rabokopola bakara bosanda. Daribo sopala katana. Thou power in the name of Jesus, move. Aha, 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 Daria Pali Katanda Sampala Kaya Boshanda. Aha, hope my eyes, hope my eyes. Aha, 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 aha. In Jesus' name we pray. Stretch your right hand towards me here. Stretch it towards me. Maseka Ponda Kandia. Father, let your power. That open it the eyes. Fall upon these hands now. As you lay these hands on your eyes, every spiritual cataract, whatever is blocking your spiritual eyes, let them fall off in the name of Jesus. Thou power of God. Move upon these hands in the name of Jesus. Aha. Lay the hands on your two eyes. Lay the hands on your two eyes. Keep it there. Keep it there. Keep it there. That's the power of God coming upon you. Something must break loose in your life tonight. Yes, yes, that's the fire. It's going into your eyes. That's the fire. 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 Yes. Baka sopoda kaya bo shende rabo komponda kanda. Ribo sopia li katanda kaya bo shende rabasa. Yes, you cannot continue. Like this, you must see. You must see. You must see. Yes, that's a fire again. Burn into the house. Aha, 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 aha. Aha. Amen. 
You see, <laughs> something has happened tonight. You see, those I see people's eyes popping open. That's right. What has been blocking those eyes from sin? It's been taken off. Aha. Say, my father. Give me the eyes of Elisha. Give me the ears of Samuel. My father. Give me the eyes of Elisha. Give me the ears of Samuel. By fire. In the name of Jesus. That's right. The eyes of Elisha. The ears of Samuel. The eyes of Elisha. The ears of Samuel. The power of God. In the name of Jesus. Move. Aha, 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 aha. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Let there be silence now. The Lord is showing me a sister here. This is very sad. Your placenta, your placenta was actually cooked and eaten by your parents. I don't know why they did that. And that has been affecting you. Right there where you are, the power of God is coming upon you. And that yoke is broken completely. That's the sister over there. Power of God is coming upon you. Aha. Aha. Now with the loudest voice, louder than anyone here. Now don't joke with this prayer. We prayed it last week and a lot of people had testimonies. In my dreams tonight... In my sleep tonight. Can you shout those two things loud and clear? I want your voice to roar like thunder. Oh God, appear in the name of Jesus. <laughs> 